You believe um, 100 percent? Really? The, the Trinity? Trinity? Yeah. Um, really? I don't know if I believe anything with 100 percent. Uh, well, Yeah, so um, what were you saying? That, sorry, with the topic. But, like, is everything ready with? Are we ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yes. Are you ready? Um, yeah, I was looking. Okay, this is just a topic that we've all kind of, you know, the Sistine Chapel. Chapel. Now, there's some paintings on the roof, and uh, I was just wondering, from a person, do you think that Christianity would have been accepted in Europe? had it not been whitewashed in the sense that we understand um, Jesus was a Jew but then when we look at the pictures in the Sistine Chapel do you think to an extent that it wasn't God who created man in his image it was man who created God in man's image what through the Christian viewpoint so, from the so, Christian so from the Christian Western view? Christian do you think if yeah. Western Christia, uh, Christianity in what we have today do you think we would have accepted it in the West had it not been watered down to have an image of a, a whitewash, like how we have the pictures of God being a white man and uh, Jesus being ethnocentric to the painters at that time, what they identified God with was themselves. Do you think we in the West would have accepted Christianity had it been Jewish kind of oriented or Middle Eastern oriented? Well, okay, my, my, my thoughts, I can only speculate of course that's all, all we can do um i'm saying maybe it might have aided the spread of christianity around europe but i can't say that it would have if it wasn't whitewashed or euthanized or whatever that it wouldn't have been accepted because of the message of christianity um because you have to look at the contextual situation you have to say were well, people of that mindset to accept the gospel message or not so i i can only with that literally with that question i can only speculate and say Definitely, maybe it might have aided the spread of it, but I can't say that if it wasn't white minds or whatever, that it wouldn't have at all taken off in another way. Do you um, think it, it creates a kind of inferiority complex in some persons? Well, okay, I mean, myself, I'm not a white person. Um, I don't feel inferior at all in that sort of manner. By the European paintings and all those sort of things of Jesus as a white person, all those sort of things, I don't feel at all inferior by that. Um, for me, it doesn't really phase me because I know at the end of the day that's not an accurate picture of Jesus it's not like but the concept yeah. that um, uh, in regards to for example the concept that God came uh, in flesh or whatever the word it may yes. be in our case yeah? yes. but he did assume a kind of appearance yes. and so that appearance yes. would have been because if we're saying that this person is now God we're given an ethnicity a color a complexion a characteristic to that person do you not think that now, or could you understand why people would be more persuaded towards one ethnicity if we are saying God is from that ethnicity? This is a part and part of why Islam, we, we forbid this kind of imagery of God, of Muhammad Sassam and so on, because it creates this kind of superiority. I do see maybe that some people can take it in that light, but we can always say that well, God, the reason why God became a person in, um, Jesus um, and through the and, uh, nation of Israel was, was to fulfill the covenant. Parliament. But the covenant was always at the end of the day that the message of the gospel like was the going to be spread to all nations. Man. And so you can harken back to um, the, uh, sort of the covenant with the Abrahamic covenant death, that through Abraham and his line, death, the rest of the world would be blessed. And so God his just chose a nation. It could have been another nation that he, he could have chosen. Okay? But I don't know the reason why he chose the Israelites. But he chose the Israelites with the purpose that they were going to be a vehicle by which the other nations of the world would be brought in. But then obviously, later on, you see the Israelites sin through idolatry and then they went into exile. Um, but I don't see the, there as a problem with superiority. So then we can go then to Romans, where we do understand in Jesus there is no nationality and distinction. There is no Jew, nor Greek, no bond, nor free, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so the, the, the message of Christianity, starting from Jesus to the apostles, was that there were to be all one nation under Jesus. It wasn't supposed to be an ethnic superiority. You, you know, um, you probably heard the arguments where Jesus
easy to have not come for such people. I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. Yes. And the other ones where the woman, she came and she wanted yes. Jesus to uh, forgive or to heal her. And he said, why should I give the breadcrumbs to the dogs? Meaning that she wasn't from the house of Israel. How would you reconcile what you just said, that Jesus was sent for all nations and all peoples, when Jesus himself says, I've not come except for the lost sheep of Israel? Yes, falls into my point because Jesus came to restore the nation of Israel who were supposed to be the ones whom which the other nations of the world were to receive the gospel and so Jesus did come to solve the problem that Israel had faced and so he did come to solve that issue but then you can see after his resurrection in Acts 1 he says you'll go the, you'll first go to Judea Samaria these other places and the other place and to the rest of the world and so we can see then and also in Matthew 28 he said go into all nations preaching the gospel okay. so then we can understand that there was something that had to be sorted out God had to be faithful to his covenant to the people of Israel and through the death and the resurrection of Jesus that was sorted out and then now the rest of the nations could receive the gospel and so Jesus' purpose was to solve the issue with the Israelites okay and I can then say that it was solved and then now it was opened up to the rest of the nations and so I don't have a I don't have an issue with that. I think it falls in with that narrative that I'm trying to put forward um, do you think the churches sometimes have been divided on the basis of ethnicity do you think in the West as we know we're speaking from a, 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 a from London obviously do you see a sharp division of churches on the base of ethnicity? Oh, yes, 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 of course we do. That, what do you think the problem to them? Yeah, I, I think that is a problem. Do you see a lot of um, ethnic churches? You see a lot of Pentecostal churches, a lot of the times African churches. Okay, do you see that's wedded together with their culture? And you can go to other churches as well. I do see that's a problem. But I still don't see it negates. Christianity as such, I do say that's an issue that we do need to work as. as no, a it's not, I don't say. No, okay, yeah, sorry, no, sorry, no, it's just something that. I've yeah, no, I, I do see it as a, I do see it as a problem. I, I don't think it's good at all to have ethnic divisions within Christianity when the gospel is supposed to be given to all people. And like I said, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so there is a big problem there that does need to be solved. That's the job of the church to um, knock down those barriers as ethnic problems. Because you do. I mean, I, I'm originally from Nigeria. I've born here, but my parents are from Nigeria. You go to Nigeria, uh, you'll see there's a lot of problems there with that sort of ethnic superiority. Uh, um, yeah. And, and that's problem, those problems need to be solved. Mm. And Black I think I don't know, that's our job as a child to do. Since we're on the topic of did man make God in his image, yes. and we've spoken about briefly about ethnicity and yes. you gave your uh, reasoning. Um, the concept of the New Testament, um, we have how many Gospels was to a canonical? Uh, so four Gospels. The four Gospels. Yes. In the New Testament, how many uh, books are there? I remember. Oh, goodness, 20, 28. 20, yeah, 27. 27. And um, of these, how many are Pauline letters? Ooh. You test my knowledge. Oh, okay. No, no, I don't expect for about say 30. Uh, okay, cool. 30. Yeah. Some of them are attributed to him. All of them are attributed to him. But there's heated debate if some of these books actually belong to him. Yes. And this is the discussion we were having last week as in why are there forged books within the New Testament? How then can we derive this kind of um, theology which makes up concepts such as Trinity if we know these books are forged? There are other verses, um, the end of Mark, for example, which talks about the resurrection. We knew that this was added on later. How then can we have confidence in a book which adds verses to support theologies such as the Trinity or the rising and dying Messiah? Um, it's a big question. So, so yeah, it is a big question. But I, I'll first you say that studio epigraphy okay, was something which was quite prevalent in that culture. So there were a lot of people who were writing in this name of the person but it wasn't actually accurate so when we say forge we have obviously our, our sort of uh, thoughts on it in this culture if you forge something obviously it's false and those sort of things but in that culture it was something which was quite prevalent so like what we were saying before you know about the, the marriage and stuff like that that was something that was, everyone was doing it was a prevalent thing you don't just look at christian works you can look at other philosophical works where that was going on and so the main issue was what oh no no i'm good thank you <laughs> cheers thank you um, the main issue was, does it, does it embody apostolic teaching? 
and the majority of people say that it does embody apostolic teaching. So the ones that are um, obviously people are debating was this written by Paul, you know, still say, well, it could have easily been written by a disciple of Paul. And so it doesn't negate the problem of being revelatory. Um, so the, the issue with Mark, I do completely agree with you. Um, there are issues in Mark that the earliest manuscripts don't have that added section in Mark 16. Um, so what was your question again? Sorry, I just yeah. Like, how can we trust issue? in a theology yeah. such as Trinity yes. when we can't trust who wrote those books and it's in the Bible? Like the whole ending of Mark, which talks about the, the, the rising yes. of Jesus, and we know because the, the other gospels, Matthew and Luke, are synoptic, which are seen as sisters, and they take a large volume of work from Mark. Um, so, so our, my question is, how then can we trust our theology of Trinity? Okay, so, okay, so firstly, the Trinity, we can say, um, is something which we don't just look to. Well, the councils, when they were trying to express or summarise the gospel witness to the person of Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit and God the Father and such, um, they didn't take that approach of just saying we need one clear-cut verse. It was, what is the testimony of the whole of Scripture? What is the testimony of the whole of the New Testament to the person of Jesus, to the person of the Spirit and the Father? And so it wasn't just that you need one clear-cut verse, and I think that's what we always argue about. Well, is there one clear-cut verse here? There are clear-cut verses where Jesus is spoken of as God, and then there's clear-cut verses. Sorry, just to, uh, I don't mean to kind of interrupt you. Yes. This is the contention, the clear-cut verses seem to be coming from the books which are disputed. So um, this this way it gets very difficult for the Christian to substantiate the concept of Trinity. Because all of the verses which we use, for example, for there are three that bear record in heaven. Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't go to that. You wouldn't yeah, no, no, I wouldn't go to that. But, okay. In fact, let's let's move to the next topic we made since we're on this topic. Um, so there's four Gospels. Which one would you date as the earliest of the four Gospels? Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which one would be yeah, the most earliest? scholars would say Mark. Mark. Um, some people do argue for Matthew, but the majority of scholars. For yourself, Mark. since we're talking. To I, I'll say Mark. Yeah, Mark, so Mark. Would you know the dating roughly of that? Um, so it's sixties. Sixties. So no problem. I'll go with. So Mark in the sixties. What would be the next one? Uh, Matthew, oh. Luke. Off the top of my head, I think it must be Matthew. But Matthew? Yeah, yeah, no problem. But that'll be more later 60s, yeah. going into the early 70s, but it's okay. just debated, yeah. Okay, so then uh, so it's Mark, Matthew, then Luke. Luke yes. And what I'll say Luke is around the same time, but we, scholars do debate. So you're saying Luke it's first? all around 60s? It's around the 60s, late 70s, and then John is the latest. Yes. Um, where the majority will say it stems from the 70s to the 90s. 70s so, 90s. 70s to the 90s. Mm -hmm. Okay, which one of the four Gospels, as you can see you said Mark, Matthew, Luke and then John, which one of the four, and John being the latest, do you think shows Jesus as a man? I think, well, which, I think they, well, I think they all have some elements of Jesus. Which one would you say is the lowest Christology that shows Jesus more like a man? Lowest Christology. I, I personally hold to a high Christology. When we die, but if I had to quantify say which one is the lowest, um, maybe Mark. Maybe well, we, we will need to go through the book itself. And which one would you say is the highest Christology? Oh, I.e. That, John, John that, 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 that Jesus is looking more like a God. Yeah, so John. John, John yes. Now, some of the scholars have made this discussion. How can we have Mark, which is the earliest gospel, and it talks of Jesus being more man-like? But over time, you see that Jesus eventually, when we get to the gospel of John, he becomes, becomes almost God-like. Do you see any interpolation yeah. there? So I mean, well, some scholars would argue against that development process. So if you go to people like Richard Borkin and his work, um, God he wants to make us he argues for there being a high Christology from life. the beginning, mm. which so you can map out in Mark, mm. and then it, does not there was then this developmental process. It does not and so um, there's the also scholars love. like uh, Louis Hurtado who, who would argue uh, for um, a high Christology as well, mm. and this, th there's no evolutionary process. Jesus mm. says and so it's, it's a divided issue, but we have to say then, what was the issue that people were debating about? Why is there a high Christology? People like Borkham will say it's because Jesus is added into the divine identity of God. Not just in John, but it happens in Mark. And so, yeah. I've got some um, just uh, the Bible here. Yes. Now, when we look at the earliest gospel, Mark 9.5, Jesus is called Rabbi. 
in the same story which is, comes later in Matthew, the same story in 17.4, Jesus is called Lord. So it's moved from Rabbi, which is teacher, to Lord, which is more exonerific. Uh, oh, sorry, is that in Mark? Can you say that again? Mark, what? Um, I've got Mark 9 5. Jesus is called Rabbi. Yes. And then later in the same story in Matthew, Jesus is want? then called Lord. So it shows uh, a more honorific or godly title being applied here. There's other verses as well, for example, Mark 10 18, where Jesus says, Why do you call me good? In Mark. One, the one we say that has a lower Christology where it makes Mark look more manly. And the later one, Matthew, say it removes this story completely. There's other stories as well. Okay, can I just yeah, sure. press button there? Um, well, firstly, uh, when we go to that one about uh, what Jesus says, uh, why do you call him good? Number one, Jesus is not negating his goodness in there because the majority of people would say Jesus is good or was good. Mm -hmm. And so is he negating his goodness mm -hmm. or is he just saying redirect and saying, well, your approach shouldn't be like that too. I think uh, it was in that verse there, it was the following verse that was, why thou hast called me good, there is none for good except yes. for the Father yes. in heaven. But, I then, think does that's he, what the but then does he negate? Does he negate his goodness? No, of course. He doesn't negate his goodness. And so he's just saying you need to redirect your question because you're approaching a teacher and just saying this person is good. When he's saying actually your focus needs to be on God. But that doesn't negate himself being good. Because we will still say he's good. What I'm showing, what I'm showing is Mark has the story. And then Matthew, which is a later development, omits the story. It does not have the story in Matthew. What I'm showing is that the earliest gospel seems to make Mark, uh, sorry, make Jesus as a man. The later gospel seems to kind of clean it up and make Jesus look more godly. Okay, but then I have to ask. I can give a few more reasons to 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 kind of okay. make it. Do you want yes, to give sure. Like yes, sure. Because I've uh, got some written down. For example, um, when we say Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm to the Father. This wasn't in any of the previous ones, it comes in the last one, John. Um, when in Mark or Luke or Matthew, in Mark and Luke there's no mention of Jesus being God. In Matthew there's a vague mention in 20, verse 23. And in John it is mentioned that he's a God in 2028. 20, Again you can see a development that he's a man, he's a man, he becomes more godly, he's a god. So we're saying how can we trust a book that we don't know who authored it and even then we're seeing that the first and oldest uh, gospel shows Jesus as a man. The ones in between are taken from the first one, that's why they're known as the synoptics. And they improve upon the appearance of Jesus as a god and finally Jesus becomes almost a fully fledged god okay. in John. So, um, the well, last, last okay. of the gospel. Okay. So first I'll say we need to establish what are the sources of these gospels. Because a lot of scholars would say actually, well, if they are based on separate eyewitness sources, there's no problem if someone emphasizes something over another. So if Matthew doesn't have um, doesn't speak about a verse in Mark, doesn't mean that he went around saying, oh, I need to remove that because that makes Jesus look too much human. Or it could be that he's drawing from a different source. Mm -hmm. And so people like Borkham will be arguing that actually, well, Mark was the interpreter of Peter. So the testimony we have in Mark is that of Peter's testimony. And the testimony we have in Matthew is of Matthew the disciple. And the testimony we have in Luke is Luke is not actually a disciple, but he was someone who went to um, collect the testimony from eyewitnesses as he speaks in Luke uh, 1. And then you have John, who, is a, who actually tested him being the beloved disciple. And people will then say, well, that's probably John, the son of Zebedee. So these are different sources. So I don't see there's a problem if one doesn't emphasize something from another. Okay? And it's, sorry, second. Also, we have to then say, you said, well, we don't know who the writers were. If you look at all of the manuscript evidence, all the manuscript evidence we have now, there is no unnamed gospel. Every single gospel we have, manuscript, is named and titled Gospel according to Mark, uh, Mark Matthew, uh, Luke and John. And so this anonymous sort of theory has no groundings and, and uh, it's really Bart Ehrman who's putting this forward. Because if you look at the internal evidence of the uh, manuscripts we have, well, it has titles in it. Okay? Second, sorry, second, oh, sorry, my point. if we look at the external evidence of the people who were writing during the time of the apostles or a bit later, they all attest to these gospels being made. There are no anonymous gospels, and we even have an enemy, Cosellus, um, who was writing in the second century, 
who assumes that the Gospels were written by disciples. And so if you wanted to attack the authenticity of the Gospels, you should have, sorry, we have unnamed Gospels here. Tell us. Yes. And, sorry, last point. Last point. Um, also, if these Gospels were going around unnamed, they were going around you know, the whole of the, the Roman Empire, unnamed, and people were going around. Why didn't they get attached with different titles? Why are they all titled Gospel of Matthew? Specifically people who weren't that prevalent in the Gospels. Why not have the Gospel of Peter, Gospel of these, Gospel of all these sort of things going around with these specific Gospels? We have Luke, who was not even a disciple. Why does it have that title? So we have issues here, and I think this anonymous theory doesn't have a lot of groundings internally with the titles and externally with the witness of the early church fathers who attest to these um, gospels being made. And so, is there any manuscripts? There's two questions I'll yes. ask. First is, are there any manuscripts that we have of uh, antiquity or old age manuscripts which has the names of these people on the actual manuscripts? Yes, all. Uh, which all one? Manus literally all manuscripts. So I, I think well, the I understood that yes. this, this was a later uh, edition. That, that's, a th yeah, that's a theory by uh, Bartholomew and other people have defended. Uh, and the second but, question would yes. be, who is the author of Hebrews? Okay, so exactly, Hebrews is unnamed. But something you see that happens with Hebrews, some of the manuscripts that we have of Hebrews, okay, because it is an anonymous uh, letter, it gets attached with different names. So some you have um, he um, uh, uh, Hebrews written by, uh, who's it, Timothy, sorry, or Hebrews written by Paul, or Hebrews written by the Romans. You have different titles attached because it is an anonymous letter. But we never have that with any of the Gospels. The Gospels don't have any, any of the manuscripts. And, and please quote me on this, go and look it up. There's no manuscript. I think the earliest manuscript we have of, um, of Matthew, which attests to the titles, was Papias IV, which is, um, I think, second century manuscript. I'm certain. Um, or Papias, sorry, so not whole manuscript. But none of the manuscripts have, um, are unnamed. And so that's a big problem here, because if there is this anonymous theory, show me manuscripts that don't have titles. But there's none. But Hebrews doesn't have a title. And then, do you know what happens? Other people put different titles. So would you say that you hold to the opinion that these Gospels were written by the names that are on oh, them? Yes. Because I we know, no we know that, in yes. that time, at that sp John, for example, Matthew, Mark, these were common names and people didn't have second names. How do we know they're not homonymous, which means that you are called John, I am called John, I'm the one who witnessed an incident, but you're writing about the incident in your name, which happens to be the same name yes, as yes. me. How do obviously, we know they're obviously not you can common have, Yes, obviously you can have that, because there was a lot of prevalent, um, a lot of common names. So people were normally um, identified by, let's say, John the son of Zebedee. That's Patrick. I can't remember what the, the name of the thing is. So John the son of Zebedee, Matthew, the tax collector. Okay, there were titles that were given to the people. And it could have been done that, but then you still have to say the external evidence that we have of the early church fathers attest to it being written by disciples. It doesn't attest to it being written by... But these, these are later documents which we know some of the manuscripts, for example, Josephus' Antiquity, yes. they have... Chris, uh, where, the, where they're accused of being forgeries within them. Um, which have Christian motifs or signatures of Christian motifs. So they embellish in the way that we can't have full confidence that this was written by, for example, Josephus, because it refers to Jesus as Christ. Whereas Josephus was a Jewish historian who would never refer to Jesus as Christ. So how can we have confidence in these uh, external sources which you're referring to? Okay, so um, I, I'm not drawing from Josephus exactly. with this. So what I'll be drawing from would be Papias, but Papias, this is uh, and I will say, I will say this to you. So Papias, we don't have an original Papias manuscript. Mm -hmm. It's found in the work of Eusebius, who was a church historian. Mm -hmm. okay? But scholars would say that this is authentic because Eusebius was an enemy of Papias. So he didn't agree with a lot of Papias' theology. So he would have normally painted him in the worst light, but he didn't do that. Okay? Um, so we have Papias featured in Eusebius. Okay? Then we have... Um, well, just for the audience, when, when was Eusebius about? So Eusebius and was writing... Works? Yes. Eusebius was writing from certain 3rd to 4th century. So this is like 300 years after the event had happened. Okay, so he's a historian. So we will obviously say that he would have had Papias' work there. Even though we might not have it now, when this historian was working, he would have had the work of Papias. So there's an assumption that It's an assumption, yes. But it's an assumption which... I, it's the simplest assumption that we can make. And instead of him forging this work, because why would he forge something for an enemy? 
when normally enemy um, testimony, if you are going to give enemy testimony, the majority of the time it's going to be true because you wouldn't pass, you wouldn't um, betray your enemy in the best light. But Papias is one of the people. We have Irenaeus, okay, who was writing in the second century. Um, if I'm certain, Irenaeus was um, a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Disciple. Um, and then we have uh, Tertullian, who was writing, writing in the third century. Okay, um, we have the Muratorian Canon, which speaks about. Um, yeah, so the just, so just to keep it um, kind of concise, yes. um, so forgive me. Um, why do you think that authors would make up stories like the end of Mark, which showed the resurrection of Jesus, if they didn't have a kind of theological intention behind that? Yes. Why would they make up stories? Okay. Uh, like the ending of Mark, which yeah. talks about the resurrection. Now, Mark is the earliest of the Gospels. Now, the ending, it doesn't, it doesn't mention nothing about the resurrection, which is like the crux of Christianity. Okay. Um, so, the synoptics, which are the two Gospels which follow, are based upon Mark and another hypothetical document called the Q document. Um, if the earliest one doesn't have it, and then the later one has it, why is it that we have a forged one? What do you think we forged it? Okay, well firstly actually, Mark does attest to the empty tomb. Yes. Mark just doesn't attest to the appearances to the disciples. But there is an empty tomb. So there's a presumption that there's something that's occurred here. It wasn't like it cut off at the crucifixion. It cut off after the appearance to the women. Okay, so there is an empty tomb. Um, this is a question, this is yes. to remind the question. The question is, why does someone attempt to forge an ending for yes. Mark, so, which shows that he was resurrected? So that, that was a copyist, so someone who was copying um, Mark, one of the scribes, okay, added an ending in And so a lot of people say that that ending was a summary of the other Gospels, what took place. And because we don't have Mark's, um, the end of, ending of Mark, a lot of people will say Mark more than likely... But he attributed him. this ending to Mark. Yes, yes, yes. So copies, but cannot yes. then other people attribute those Gospels to the other Gospel writers of, in the same yes, manner? Of course they could, but we don't have the manuscripts evidence to show that. We have the manuscript evidence to show that this was more than likely false, okay, because the earliest manuscripts don't have this ending. Okay? So we have about but, four different endings for Mark, right? Yes, yeah, so I mean, you, it, it does vary, it does vary. Um, Why would we have so much people writing about the end of Mark? Because Do you a, think it's because yeah. it's the earliest gospel and people are determined to show that he did get resurrected? Uh, I don't think so. I think because there's a presumption here that Mark wouldn't have ended in that way. So loads of people want to go and finish the ending. Mm -hmm. So it would be better if a lot of people didn't add that ending in. Because then there'll be an assumption that Mark meant to end it there. But a lot of people say, actually, why would Mark cut off at that point? Mm -hmm. Just the empty tomb and the women going away and the angel appearing to the women to say, you know, all these sort of things. Why would it cut off at that place? Mm -hmm. So there's an assumption here that there must have been an ending. So a lot of scholars will argue that we've just lost the ending. Something happened with the original script or the copies of the original script that we just lost the ending. Of it. But no. we can only speculate. I mean, at the end of the day, we can't argue for it. But the case for the resurrection can be built off of not just Mark itself. So I say we always have to take that approach of... Which, which gospel would you use? Because yeah, so the point was that Mark was the earliest one which appeared to make him look more like a man and there was no resurrection. Whereas when we move further away from the actual event, when we go to the last gospel, yes, he looks more godly and then this resurrection account. Okay. Um, there's one question I wanted to ask is um, the accounts that are being written in four of these gospels, and it may seem like a, a cheesy question. If all of the people ran away from the, the Romans when they captured Jesus, who then writes the story? Okay. So Number one, we would say then that, let's say we're looking at Mark, okay, we would say that that part of the testimony is not from Peter, if we're going with the, the theory that Peter, Mark was the interpreter of Peter. Mm. That part wasn't. Mm. But that part could have easily been from the women. Mm -hmm. Or that part could have been easily from... This is just hypothetical. Someone. No, that's what I'm saying, but we need to make sense of it. Of we need to try and put a hypothesis and say mm -hmm. what best explains what we have mm -hmm. here. And so, so Mark, say, would have not, he would not have been the author of that. Well, no, no. So remember what I'm saying. Mark is simply, mm. in the argument I'm putting forward, an interpreter of Peter. Mm. So Peter is a source of the gospel, yeah, the information from Mark. But obviously, Peter wasn't there, mm. so then the source must have been picked from other things. But it's still attributed under someone else's name. 
Why, why sorry, attribute. It's still attributed to Mark's work. Yeah. So Mark would have simply not interpreted Peter there, mm -hmm. but he would have gone and written his from, own. No, no, it doesn't have to be from his own, mm -hmm. it could have been from someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we all we have to do is what makes the best sense of this. But like I was trying to say, the resurrection can be, for me, built from a case of the totality of scripture. And you were, I think you were conflating two issues. You were saying Sorry. the divinity mm. of Jesus, which you believe is an evolutionary period, starting off with the low Christology, yes. moving up to the highest Christology. Yeah, I think there's a lot of scholars okay. discuss this, so, that there's a low Christology mm -hmm. in the earliest, man, okay. er, earliest gospel. Yeah. As it progresses towards the last gospel, John, you see a much higher Christology of godliness of Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, some scholars will debate that issue and say that actually there's a high Christology in the, the synoptic gospel, so there's not this evolutionary uh, process. But what I was trying to say is that you're, there's two issues completed here. I'm not just speaking about the divinity of Jesus, because we can go into that, but the core of Christianity is the resurrection. And I'm saying the resurrection doesn't just have to be built off of Mark, it can be built off the totality of the gospels and the rest of scripture. And so, so we can then try and say, what best explains the data? Was Jesus resurrected or was he not resurrected? Was there something? Because a lot of scholars would say there are certain facts that we can take from the Gospels. What is the best explanation of this? And people will say, can I, can I just state the four facts if that's possible? Of course, yeah, okay. yeah, of course. So people will say um, the, the disciples believed that they had um, an appearance of Jesus. Okay, so the disciples believed this. It didn't actually have to have occurred, but the disciples did go around believing that there was this appearance. Okay, um, that Je also Paul believed that he had an appearance of Jesus. James believed that he had an appearance of Jesus, and there was an empty tomb. And so some scholars will say, these facts we have here, what best explains them? Was it just simply hallucinations? Did the disciples just have a hallucination of this person of Jesus? But then why would that be group hallucinations? Because normally when you hallucinate, it's just a subjective experience. So if I hallucinate to something, I can't say, you go, come on, you know, hallucinate the so, same so thing. So are you me. saying if so, we have a group hallucination, because these events do happen. Yes. As in group hallucinations do actually yes. happen. There are studies on it which shows that there are times people often in group hallucinate yes. about series of events as if they had happened and actually they hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. So um, you're saying it can't happen? No, I didn't say the, the impossibility of it, but you I say, say it's very improbable. Uh -huh. Highly, highly improbable. So but it's more probable that Jesus yes. had r rose okay. from death. One second. So I'm trying to say to you that what best explains this, if we have hallucinations, let's say I gave you group hallucination, I said the disciples, then how would that explain also Paul's hallucination? Because Paul wasn't in the mental frame of mind to have a hallucination of a crucified Messiah. Why would he? He was someone who was persecuting Christians. Are you so, talking when he was on the road to Damascus? Yes, so I'm saying his, his conversion experience, okay, I can't attest to it as a hallucination. Because why would he be in the mindset, the mental frame? Well, his his hallucination was that not that Jesus got resurrected, if I'm correct. It's just that, um, that's the, because we're talking about the resurrection, mm -hmm. hallucinations about the, Paul's one wasn't a hallucination about the resurrection of Jesus, correct me what, if I'm wrong. What was it? Because the normal understanding was that that this what, was a resurrection Why do you per persecute me? I think yes. this is why I remember but it, it was, that Paul, yeah. Paul is being questioned mm -hmm. by a vision of Jesus who is asking why do thou persecute me mm -hmm. but then what we try yeah, to say no no so he does have that he does have that experience but he himself believed it was an appearance of the resurrected res Jesus no oh, oh, of the yeah. resur resurrected Jesus yeah. because then you go to his writings in Corinthians 1 Corinthians 15 which the majority of scholars would say part of it the first part is an early creed mm -hmm. that Paul had um, uh, was passing on to the church mm -hmm. and in this he says um, that Jesus appeared to Cephas, he appeared to James, he appeared to the 500 and last of all he appeared to me. Mm -hmm. So he's then equating his appearances with the same appearances of Peter mm -hmm. and of James of, of the 500. Mm -hmm. So he's saying I had the same appearance mm -hmm. of these people even though it's a later time. Mm -hmm. The same appearance that they had of this resurrected Messiah I had as well. And that's why he believed that he had the authority to be an apostle. There's a story yes. that of the um, 500, is it, that was raised from the dead? 500 was raised. Oh, yeah. so people who were resurrected yeah. at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Yeah, that's right. Picture. How many so, was it? Was it 500? I don't know right? if it's 500. Paul, would you... Would you... 500 refers to yes. the division. 
Corinthians. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What he's I think, is a zombie apocalypse. Oh, that one, that one. Matthew 27, where, not 500, but multitudes of people came out of their graves, walked around, and went home and had tea, and apparently there's only two verses in history that caused that event, which is remarkable if actually Yes, yes. We call it the zombie apocalypse. Okay, perfect. So, so, so this this event, mm -hmm. would you take that historically that would, so many people resurrected at the death or at the death of Jesus? And if so, what happened to these persons? And how come there's no, as a yes, brother yes. Paul mentioned, mm -hmm. how come there are no other historical writers mentioning such a grand event? As yes. how can we then take this historically? Yes, I wouldn't take that if, um, that exact. Well, I would say that we don't have enough evidence to say that this was a historical um, event. Okay. But I can easily say that it was apocalyptic. It was an apocalyptic utterance. So maybe even that Matthew wasn't going around trying to deceive people here, but he was trying to say that the the gravity of what happened, okay, that people were even coming to life. That could be a hypothesis you can put forward. Some people might say that Matthew wasn't. Do you telling think the truth again? Well, do you think again they were trying to um, emphasize? on the death of Jesus being this magnitude. Yes, that's, that's what I was trying to so, say. Yes. So this is generally the crux of the uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. As in you have many people writing in people's name, emphasizing things, mm -hmm. rising in the Christology. Yep. Then how can we then trust this book to give us a theology that Jesus, Jesus is part of a triune God? So the tri you want to go to the divinity? This is the ultimate one. You want to go to the divinity? Okay. We've spoken about the rising concept of Jesus from man to being a God. And we spoke about the Gospels and the authorship again. But ultimately, in the bigger picture of our discussion is how then can we believe about the theology of Trinity taken from this book, the Bible? Okay, so the Trinity, not resurrection. So then, even though there might be parts which are debatable historically, it doesn't mean the whole book itself is um, historically un unreliable. So even if there might be parts which, through a criteria which historians might use to try and you know, mill out the, the historical nucleus of the Gospels, okay, doesn't mean that the rest of that is false. And so even if there's something which is difficult, we can still say we can build a case of something which is historical. And so with the issue of the divinity of Christ, that's what you want to sort of well, speak this is about. Some, yes. This was a, a later okay. kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. Most Christians, when they go into studying theology, they suffer from severe doubt. Severe doubt. You hear a lot of stories. From your personal experience, have you ever been plagued, um, honestly, by any doubts? Oh, yes, yes, from yes, of course. Of Could course. you just describe yes, to yeah, the yeah, cameras, no. so, uh, about your yeah, journey? Yeah, yeah, so uh, what, my, my whole journey to... Not your whole yeah. journey. Some so, I mean, the, I, yeah, I, be, I, became, the, yeah, I yeah. became a Christian um, six years ago. So... Um, I was 19 when I became Christian, 25 now, um, and I had an experience with God that changed my life. Then I went to Bible college, I went to a theological college in London, um, studied theology, fell in love with it, but like you're saying, had doubts. I had doubts about my faith, I had doubts about the, the person of Jesus, is he Could God or is he Could you give us some of the examples? So, Without, uh, um, there's no, by yes. no means to mm -hmm. make you, you know, to take a weakness off you. There's not, no, at all. it's just yeah. experiential. Yes. I'd like to, uh, yeah, to I don't, I don't think, I yeah. hear a lot of these scholars who are former Christians, mm -hmm. like even Bart Ehrman, for example, yeah. we spoke about him, and they all mentioned that the more academic they got about Christianity, the more atheistic they all eventually became. Yeah. I can't imagine that no, anyone that enters into this academic circle comes out unscathed. Mm -hmm. If you believe in the uh, uh, in the Bible being 100% um, factual and historical and the er er inerrancy of the Bible, and you come out thinking, no, I no longer believe in this. Yeah, I, I, I do see. Um, and why do you a lot think people, this is? Yeah, well, when you study things, because I do think theology itself is challenging. Mm -hmm. Just one issue about Barham. Barham didn't become an atheist because of his historical studies. Yeah, it, was about, it was actually the problem of evil, which yeah, was a big problem yeah. for him that you couldn't sort of hold to. Um, but I do see people obviously going through the process, studying the scripture and saying, well, I have issues here and I can't you know, bring it together. And that is a problem. I myself have gone through, like you were saying, I was going through doubts, looking at scripture saying, Could you well, if you have, the... yeah. I mean, some people will say, if you have a plain reading of scripture without any contextual um, aspect to it, you might not come to the doctrine of Trinity. And I'm happy to say that. If I locked you in a room, just with the Bible, nothing, you're just an alien, you just come down, read the Bible, yeah, you will struggle to, to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity, I believe that. I think you will have some aspects where you can say there is something about the divinity of Christ, but I wouldn't hold to the whole triune God, because that is something which, because of my tradition, I hold to. Okay? 
Um, so how would you come to the conclusion of Trinity if it's hard okay. to read it in there without okay. external... Well, okay, my, my main thing is to say where is the authority to interpret scripture? I, as myself, I hold to the authority of church tradition. Okay. And so I would say that if you look throughout, well, for at least till the Reformation in 1517, okay, there was this um, interpretive mechanism of the church, tradition, and scripture. Would you say that this is recorded material or is it oral tradition? So, well, you have oral tradition that a lot of people will say was passed on through the bishops and things like that. Um, and then you have the magisterium. So Catholics will say we have the magisterium, we have the overriding, overriding church, which helps us to interpret scripture according to tradition and um, scripture itself. So I have an issue with Protestantism because it is an issue. If you just have the Bible by itself, you can interpret as many things as you want. Sola Scriptura. Yeah, so I, I have an issue with Sola Scriptura. So I would say you do need the authority of the church. But how do you know the oral traditions are actually accurate? Well, obviously... Because you, yeah, you know, yeah. so, in, for example, Islamic yeah. sciences, we have something similar. But we have a study in itself, like the chain of transmission. We know that this text is authentic, or most probable to be authentic, because it went through this person who had met this person, and he lived at the same period of that time. It was likely, and you know, that they had. So then, this, thus, the text is actually authentic. How would you uh, verify that one of your oral transmissions is actually authentic? Because especially if this is what helps you read uh, Trinity inside the Bible. Well, in Christianity, I mean, the early church held to apostolic succession. So the oral tradition would have been, let's say, passed on from, let's say, Peter at Rome. He passed it on then to the Bishop of Rome. And then he, that Bishop of Rome, when he was going to um, go away or whatever, dying, he was going to pass it on to someone else. So we will say that we have to hold to apostolic succession. Protestant churches would not necessarily hold to that. And I think that's a problem. Do you have like yeah. a chain of transmission? So, I mean... Like as in yeah. this guy from that guy, got mm -hmm. it from that guy, who got it from that guy, who got it from the source. Do you have well, that chain? Okay, so let's say we have someone like Clement of Rome. Mm -hmm. Clement of Rome was an early church father who was writing, and a lot of people would say he was a pope mm -hmm. um, in Rome, one of the earliest popes. I think they say the third, or some people say the first, some people say the third. So then they would, we would say that we have a chain here from Clement of Rome, who then we have another person before him, another person, then we'll have Peter. And so we have then Clement of Rome passing on this oral tradition during the, um, down the line. So there's a big, big emphasis here on this apostolic succession. And so I would say that I am able to interpret scripture trinitarianly because of the authority of the church. And I can see that's the way the church always operated. Strange question. Once it was happened, that's the way the church always operated. Because if you see Matthew 28, Jesus gives the authority to the disciples. He doesn't actually necessarily give it to the scriptures themselves. He gives the authorities to the disciples. Why the scripture itself is authoritative is because it embodies apostolic testimony. And so we can then see the authority of the church is the importance here. And I would say then that we have this process of the church and then the conciliar decisions, which is part of the church itself. And so I can then interpret scripture according to um, the bishops and the councils. And that's why I can then say I can read scripture itself trinitarianly or holding the incarnation. But if I was to be honest, if you're just going to be a Protestant, there is a problem there. Because if you just hold to Sola Scriptura, then you have an issue with um, interpreting scripture. That's why you have thousands of Protestant denominations because people say, I have the Holy Spirit, I can read the Bible, this is the authority, and now this is the correct interpretation. I mean, there's pastors in Africa who are telling their congregation to eat grass, I mean, to feel the Holy Spirit, and they, come on. But I mean, that, yeah. so that's issues, but you don't really have that issues, let's say, in the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church because of the importance of tradition and the authority of the church. So we have a guiding lens to interpret scripture. Okay? And so that's why I hold more to that um, that aspect than a Protestant. Um, but I can that's why can you, you can yeah. you see with the point that we're getting yeah. at the Trinity is the confusion because it's swerved from the normative. The normative being the Abrahamic religion of Judaism and Islam. They hold to a strict monolithic monotheism, which is the belief of only one God and the worship of only one God without any divisions of any sort of persons or personalities. Um, they say that God is just one. So then when Christianity comes or a triune kind of concept of God, it swerves from the normative, but it doesn't provide substantial evidence from itself 
it's, 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 it's not persuasive as in could you could you understand from the point of a Muslim that you have a book and um, even the Old Testament which we didn't get into that we don't know the authorship we don't know the strength of what is being said we know there are multiple authors of single books there are uh, attributions to other people which aren't rightfully so and then there are changing of verses addition of books uh, taken out of words and variations which um, account to more words than in the actual Bible. Can you see where a Muslim would be confused about how the Trinity ended up in Christian theology? Yeah, so, or or yeah. non-Muslim okay. rather, okay. Uh, non-Christian. No, so obviously I'm, I'm, non it's, it's a complex issue. The church has yeah. been trying to define and the that's Trinity for centuries. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a complex issue. I'll never yeah. say to anyone it's a simple thing. Do you believe um, 100%? Really? The Trinity? The Trinity? Yeah. Um, really? I don't know if I believe anything with 100%, uh, but, but, but I'll, say, I'll say there's a very... 99% I believe. Right. How doubtful? Well, look, What's the lowest you, you've been in? Because a lot of people have a problem with the Trinity, okay. Christians included, and that's why many people leave Christianity and tend to often go through monotheistic, monolithically monotheistic religions as well. Um, because they have the problem with Trinity. How many times have you had a problem with the Trinity? Oh, I've, I've had problems loads of times making sense of it. When I was um, in through my BA, obviously understanding it, I had issues uh, with the coherency of it, um, I felt issues of it that was logically contradictory, um, but I've come to a place of seeing I don't see there's a logical incoherence here. I don't see if people truly understand the terms that are being used. Um, but just to go to monotheism, we have to distinguish two issues here, monotheism and unitarianism. I think a lot of the time they get conflated. Why Mono are you Muslim? Sorry? Why aren't you Muslim? Why aren't I Muslim? Yeah, yeah. Why are you not Muslim? Because I believe... What stops you from accepting okay. Islam? Is Islam reason, is the monotheistic kind of belief okay. that God... Can I, can I yes, answer sure. that and then answer that yes, question? Sure, yeah. after. So, any, any order what I was trying to say is monotheism and Unitarianism gets conflated together. Mm. Unitarianism is believing God is one person, mm. unitary substance, mm. okay? Monotheism is saying there is one God. Mm. Trinitarians will say we are monotheistic, we hold to there being one God, but we are not Unitarian saying that God is just one person. And the Bible itself doesn't speak about Unitarianism, it just speaks about monotheism, that there is one God. But it never de defines what it does mean to be God, okay? It just says that there is one God who is the one creator of all and is the Lord over all, okay? But it never actually goes into the ontological status of this one God. And so we read in a lot and say, well, when it says, Hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. One what? One God, okay, but what do you mean by Theos? What do you mean by God? And so it's an open question because Unitarianism or the understanding of personhood, there being one person. Is it personalities or person, in your case, okay. would you say personality or persons? Okay, so I mean, there's two sort of ways you can attack this. Um, there's people who are social Trinitarians and there's people who are Latin Trinitarians. Social Trinitarians try to say that God is three persons and try to make sense of how these three persons are one God. Latin Trinitarians will say there is one God, one, one being that is God. We try to make sense, how is this one God, three persons? And so for me, I'm, I'm sort of divide, I'm divided on the issue because I see truth in social Trinitarians. So social Trinitarians will say there are three persons who are God, who are divine, three divine persons, yet they compose one God. So they would say there is one divine community, okay? one divine community, which we can call God, okay? that is composed by three divine persons. This is interesting okay. because then it moves away traditionally what we're told that God is one. So there's a redefinition of some words. For example, God is an entity or as you just said, is a community. Mm -hmm. It's like some people can even argue that it's a family of gods. Mm, okay. That God is a family that consists of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it, doesn't it seem like a bit of a word game at that point? Well, it's, I don't think it's a word game, but I think it's saying, number one, when we're saying Jesus, the, the Son is God, the, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We are talking about the um, a predication. We're saying that we're prescribing divinity to these three persons. But then we can also say that they compose one God, as in um, we're using the proper noun here, God. Even though there are three divine persons, okay, there is one Theos, one God. And so you can then read that into um, Deuteronomy 6 and say, Hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. Yes, one God, one divine community, 
Okay. Uh, that, what do you mean? You keep saying divine no, because community. What I'm saying to you yeah. here is there is no specification of God. So when a lot of people are trying to read into this ontology into God and saying God is one person, when it says so you're saying when it says that a Shema, God is community, no, like a team or no, 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 no. I'm saying you could. I'm not no. a social trinitarian. I said oh, I'm yes, divided yes, on this yes, issue. Yes, yes. But a way to read it could be when it says that there is one God, Yahweh is one. It doesn't it's seem return. like a radical, radical redefinition of the it's word not. because when we say God is now a community, it's clear. If you said God is a community, it's clear to to everyone that it seems like a bunch of kind of persons in one entity and, and this is why I have a problem with the words and terminology at yes. times seem very fuzzy we're told that it's persons or personalities in one entity or one body or, but these terms are never clearly defined yes, it true. seems like semantics almost in order to justify that God can be in multiple persons yeah. or personalities I, I, I don't feel it's semantics I just feel like I said there's two perspectives on this when the Greek theologians were speaking about the Trinity okay they took Took more of that social trinitarian viewpoint when the latin trinitarians were taking that okay sorry when the latins were taking that approach they took i'm um, saying that god is one substance tried to make it or uh, make sense of the, the the personhood of god but i don't believe it's semantics because at the end of the day you have to remember what is the object of our study the object of our study is God. Obviously, there's going to be things that are difficult to understand. Okay, the natural world itself is extremely difficult to understand. Okay, we struggle to understand physics. We struggle to understand chemistry. We struggle to understand biology. People have been debating for centuries about these things. Okay, how much more God? That is, I don't think that's how to do evangelism. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, so our objective study is God. I expect so there to be challenges. So you're saying there's mystery, there's a lot no, 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 of mystery. No, 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 I don't say there's mystery. I don't say that. I approach. think in the last, the last no. conversation you said there's an sorry. element of mystery. Okay. So, I, yeah, sorry. I don't believe the whole doctrine itself is mysterious, but I believe there's mis um, mystical elements that we can't understand. Such as? So, um, let's say... Because I've heard, we've, we've all heard this concept that the Trinity is a mystery. Yes. And it almost seems like a cop-up. I it can't is, explain yes. it. You don't understand it, mainly because I can't articulate it because I don't understand it. Yeah. But you have to believe it in it anyway. I think I think it is a cop out. Mm. And I don't agree with people who just say, sorry, Trinity's a mystery, just believe it, Jesus is God. I don't think that's the approach. And that hasn't been the approach of the church throughout the centuries. The church have always tried to make sense of the Trinity. They've never just said it's a mystery. When they meant it was a mystery, by the way, Aquinas, um, a person called Duns Scotus, Augustine, um, Athanasius, when they used the term mystery, they meant that it was something which derived from revelation. It wasn't something you could just think about in your mind by reason and come Not to there being the Trinity. You had to, it had to be given to you by a revelation. So if someone so. is beyond the scope of the church and the Bible, then they are damned in limbo? Oh, sorry, this is a different issue. So uh, if they're... Because the, well, limbo, you're saying that limbo, to believe in Trinity, you need to have traditions of the church in order to support the scripture. But yes. what about the uh, people who've never seen the scripture, people who've not been in contact with the church? Where do they go? Okay, so someone who... Well, at the, the end of the day, sets, at the, end of the, day the, the gospel message isn't believe in the Trinity. Mm. It's not believe that Christ is um, even divine. It's not even believe that, so you know... So I can, I can be a so, Christian without believing so that. So I'm saying what makes you a Christian, okay, is submitting to Christ as Lord and believing that he was resurrected from the dead. That is the most important thing you see in Romans 10.10. 10. But this Paul, is what we Paul, mentioned, this sorry. element is missing historically no, no, from so the... What I'm trying to say to you is that, so I'm trying to answer your question, if someone is living in the Amazonian jungle, never heard of the Bible, or has the Bible or something, or is confused about the Trinity, okay, the gospel message that I will approach that person is not believe in the hypostatic union or believe in the hypostases, there being three hypostases, there being one usia in the, the Trinity. I, that's not the gospel message, that never it was it. I would say once you are in the church, it's important that you understand um, who God is like and what God is. I think that's very important. But the gospel message itself is believing that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he has been raised from the dead and submitting to him as Lord of your life. Because I promise you, speak to my, my mum or my grandma, they might not be able to explain to you the doctrine of the Trinity in the way that an Athen Athenasius could. That doesn't mean that they're going to go to hell, of course not.
okay? But it's very important that we do study and really understand how God is like. Because Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the most important thing to Jesus. So we do need to, if we love God, love him with our mind and study the Bible. So where do study these guys go tradition. at the end of the day when the sun sets? Is it heaven or so, hell? What, someone, the, someone who doesn't... Someone who's not been in contact, as we just explained, with the church and does not believe in the Trinity. Well, someone who believes the gospel, I'll obviously say that they're with, with God. Someone who's not seen the gospel. Never heard the gospel? Okay, so now this is, a, this is an issue. Some people would say you go to hell. I myself am an annihilationist, so I believe when you pass away, um, because I don't believe in there being an eternal soul. Mm -hmm. I think eternality is a gift given by God. So when you believe in the gospel, God then bestows on you the gift of eternality. But the soul intrinsically is not eternal, so it will perish once, it, once you die. So if you do not believe in the gospel, then you will perish, you will die. And so some people traditionally would say it's hell, there's a literal hell that you burn. I would say philosophically I have an issue with that, but also theologically I think there's a lot of people who argue for it not actually being a literal hell, but it's you being eternally punished, and that's simply that you will not be re resurrected from the dead. It seems uh, like you know your stuff and obviously um, you've learned quite a lot in the journey. But what about persons of laity who don't know much about Christianity like myself? Mm -hmm. How can I profess to the Trinity when it's so complex? Okay, you don't have to understand the, understand the, intri um, the intrinsic nature of the Trinity. I'm not saying that you have to understand it to the level of a PhD student or a lecturer or a professor. I don't think you need to do that. You can easily say that God is one, okay, and God is three persons. And so the way people have tried to do it is try to make sense that God is this... Um, when we say persons, usually we think of a fully bodied human being. Yeah. So when you say person A, B and C and then say they are in a community, it's very hard for someone who believes in one God that three persons is one God. Unless you revive, redefine... Well, it's, like I said, um, theos, the word God, is ambiguous. Mm. And so you can then say, when you're talking about there being one God, you're referring to the one divine community. When you say there are three persons, you're talking about the three divine persons who constitute this divine community. Okay? And so when I'm saying there is one God, you're referring to the community. When you're referring, um, when you're saying there are three persons, you're referring to the three persons who constitute this um, community. And so, but then it's not as simple as that. We'll also say that there is an ontological unity between the three persons. They all instantiate the one divine nature. So, but the, the, this is one thing we were yes. discussing before because you say the essence, essence doesn't change. Mm -hmm. I asked was one of the essence knowledge mm -hmm. last time because we did see that God's knowledge does change. For example, when God the Father, or, or I'm not sure which way you verbalize it, when the Father, you say he's all-knowing. But then when Jesus is uh, depicted in the Gospels, it's clear that he is not all-knowing. Um, he doesn't seem to have knowledge of the last hour. He does not seem to have knowledge of the season of figs and many other ones. Um, so how then would you explain that if God is not changing in his essence, how then does the Father and the Son change in okay, his so essence of knowledge? We're not, I wouldn't say that they're changing in their essence. I would say that the Son... It's fully, it is knowledge essence. Is, so knowledge, omniscient, is a attribute of divinity. It's a divine property. Of essence. It's part, yeah, it's part of the divine nature, of divine essence. essence. Okay. So I would say that's a necessary attribute that if you are God, you must instantiate this property of omniscience or knowingness. And so the Son, who is God, possessed this whilst he was on earth. Okay. And that was residing within his divine nature. But the Son, whilst he was on earth, was only slowly operating through his human nature. Okay? And so when he was, he didn't know something, it's referring to his divine nature, so his human nature. So, so, so you're saying that the two natures are side by side, so, but one knows of something whilst the other doesn't. Well, uh, yes, so there's a human nature, the hypostatic union. But there are some yes. things that one of them does know of the other. You're saying there's some so, of them are unknown. Okay, too. so the way to... Yeah. Uh, so if I could just clarify yes. the point. For example, you and I are in one body as two natures. You're one nature, I'm one nature. Your nature is all-knowing. My nature is not all-knowing. You're saying I have no knowledge of your knowledge and you have no knowledge of my knowledge. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I would say that um, the human nature and the divine nature, the divine nature knew all things, but the human nature, okay, in Christ, never accessed the knowledge of the divine nature. So, okay, the way I make sense of this is through 
um, the subliminal mind. So Jesus, whilst he was the son, whilst he was on earth, okay, the human nature, okay, was simply operating through his consciousness, and so the divine nature was in his subconscious, and so. The, hu the conscious mind can sometimes access the subconscious, okay? But it doesn't have to operate it through all the time. So now, my subconscious mind, now I just thought, okay, my wife, I thought of my, you know, my, my family, one second, I thought of my family, that now it's in my consciousness, but before it was in my subconscious. So my divine nature, the divine nature of Christ was in his subconscious. The human nature of Christ was in his conscious mind. And so people like, let's say, Richard Swinburne, who's a, He's a, he's a philosopher, um, he's a retired professor from Oxford. He held to the divided mind. And there's two minds in Christ, divided minds, okay? Whilst Christ was on earth, he operated through his human mind, okay? But he never accessed his divine mind, okay? And so there were two natures in Christ, but the one that um, Jesus was operating under was his human mind. Okay? This, this is swinging, um, you know, for the lack of language, it's going to sound crude, but multiple personality disorder mm. this is almost what it sounds like okay yes and the thing is though that's a good point because it helps the point of the christian because people are trying to say a divided mind is logically incoherent but if i can give you an example where there is a logical possible situation where someone can have a divided mind then i've just shown you now that that divided mind scenario is not logically impossible because when someone says the incarnation does not make sense they are saying it is logically incoherent the statements of there being a human mind and a divine mind together, they logically contradict. But then I can give so you that at scenario. Times Jesus is divine at no. times is human. Is that no, no. What so I can give you no, no, no. So I can give you an example of multi, multiple personality disorder, where two people have divided minds within one person. That then shows that my scenario is logically coherent. So the incarnation is logically coherent. So Jesus had a divided mind, but he didn't have it through multiple personality disorder. Someone would have it here through multiple personality disorder, but Jesus didn't. So you you then would support the Christian by saying, yes, it is logically possible for there to be a divided mind. In, in If you narrow it down to that aspect, but when you widen and broaden it, you're actually saying that he wasn't aware of that side. Yes, yeah, so I said whilst he was on earth. Because this because, is what happens in multiple that, personality that's a, yeah, sorry, disorder. Yeah, One is not exactly, aware of the exactly, other. Exactly. But you're, are you suggesting that Jesus, the man, is not aware, of, or the man nature is not aware of Jesus, the divine nature within the same yes. body? I would say at most time of his life he was not aware of it, but the divine mind could was aware of the mind of the human. So at what times, mind. how do we know he was operating as the man and how do we know when he was so, operating okay, as I the man? I could say God. maybe when he um, uttered prophetic um, utterances, yeah. so that could have been from the divine mind. Yeah. So when he said something was going to occur or something like this was going to happen or he, he saw someone under the fig tree over there or something, that could have been the divine mind giving that information to his human mind. Yeah. Okay, So that could be a scenario there. But the majority of his life, he operated through the um, human mind because he needed to let go of this prestige of divinity, as it says in Philippians 2. So he didn't, op he didn't walk around just on God on earth, you know, zap, 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 here, da, 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 da. because then he wouldn't have let go of that prestige of divinity and been like us. And the, important was, the importance was that he was like us, that he suffered like us, that he went through experiences like us so that the atonement could be um, effective for all of humanity. Meaning that God had to die? Well, I would say it depends. Atonement... This is what you mean yeah. by effective. You mean the, the God nature died? No, no, not the God nature. So it's the human nature that ceased. So how do you know as a human? So this is this is where we go. At one point he's human. One no, so how do you tell when he's human? And so when then he's we would uh, have God? to say what makes sense of this is because we know um, that God is eternal. That's an essential attribute of divinity. If God is eternal, sorry, if God died, then that means that he ceased to um, possess the property of eternality, mm -hmm. and that's an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. God must always exist, well, and so then, seen. then. If there is a scenario where Jesus died, we're simply saying that it was then, what makes the best sense of it, is not it, the divine nature dying, but it's simply the human nature. Could it not be that all of it is just made up? Of course it could be, that's a possibility. But then it we seems have to say, like we're doing no, but, so much gymnastics no, but we don't have to, to, get, to get to this point that well, yeah. sometimes someone would just say, why don't we just cut through and sit? it looks a bit stretched, you know? Then, when we go through, yeah. the, if, we, if we just review our whole conversation, it seems we've done so much to get to the point 
that Jesus, Jesus to be God, we have to explain all the, why don't we just say it looks more probable that all of these stories are just made up? Okay, I think, I think um, it's not an issue about probability. I, I would say to you, it is possible, logically possible, that this was all made up. I would say to you that from the evidence that we looked at, okay, the, the evidence supports a hypothesis of it not being made up. Mm -hmm. So from the what we've gone through this whole conversation, I would say we looked at verse, we looked at this, and things support um, the hypothesis of this not being just you know fabricated. So it is possible, of course, mm. and that's why we always have to work with probabilities mm. in anything in life, mm. because there is a scenario where this could be wrong. Anything could be. Wrong. I mean, like I said in a previous debate with someone, you standing in front of me. This is a discussion. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. no, but I'm saying yeah. you being in front of me. Okay, I believe it's highly, highly probable that you are in front of me. But I can't say it's 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say I 99%. This I yeah. But there is a possibility that this could all be a figment of my imagination. So majority of things, or I'll say all things except for necessary truths, we have to hold um, probabilistically. And so obviously I would say there is a chance that this could be false. Could that but trespass and ask what it is that you had studied? What, what did I study? Yeah. Is it oh. philosophy or...? So, okay, so I studied um, theology, mm. a theology degree for my BA. Um, then I did a Masters of Arts in Philosophy of Religion and Ethics. Mm -hmm. And now I'm doing a PhD in Philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so but I'm looking at um, Christian, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Philosophy of Religion. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm really focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, so I started off loving theology and I do love theology so much. But I'll always, say, I'll always point and say Richard is a better person when you need to just talk about the biblical text. Yeah, yeah. Because he's yeah. studied a lot further when it comes to is he the here text. Today? I don't think no, he's no, here. I spoke to him, I, I think he's oh. not here. He's not here today. But Can with you the biblical text. Him to come in? No, I think he was he had to see someone, but he'll yeah. be back again. But biblical text, mm -hmm. he's the best person. Mm -hmm. Um but I try to argue more philosophically, but mm -hmm. I do know a bit of the biblical text as well. Mm -hmm. Um but I'm always learning. I mean that's how you always have to be. Yeah, Great speaking to you, man. Yeah, really so, good speaking to you. God it's bless you. Yeah. Thank As you very always. much. Thanks a lot. Very mate. Yeah. Good speaking to you, mate. Thank you, Josh. No problem, man. Thanks. Let's